Wisdom, the final frontier to true knowledge. Welcome to Wisdom Trek, where our mission is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Hello, my friend. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, your captain on our journey to increase wisdom and create a living legacy. Thank you for joining us today as we explore wisdom on our second millennium of podcast. This is day 1,291 of our trek, and it is Worldview Wednesday. Creating a biblical worldview is important in order to have a proper perspective on today's current events. To establish a biblical worldview, it is required that we also have a proper understanding of God and His Word. Our focus for the next several months on Worldview Wednesday is mastering the Bible through a series of brief insights. These insights are extracted from a book by the same title from one of today's most prominent Hebrew scholars, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. This book is a collection of insights designed to help you to understand the Bible better. When we let the Bible be what it is, we can understand it as the original readers did and as the original writers intended. Each week, we will explore two additional insights. And today's topic will be Mastering the Bible, Babel Frames History. So insight number 25 is... The Rebellion at the Tower of Babel Frames the Rest of Biblical History Dr. Heiser mentioned the Tower of Babel story from Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 in Insight number 11, which he examined how ancient biblical people understood their world. Genesis 11 isn't the only passage that talks about this event. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 8 and 9, one of the most important passages of the Old Testament for understanding the worldview of the people of the Bible, does as well. The New Living Translation translates it this way. When the Most High assigned lands to the nation, he divided up the human race. He established the boundaries of the people, according to the number of his heavenly court. For the people of Israel belonged to the Lord. Jacob was his special possession. When God divided the nations, the punishment at Babel when their languages were confused, he distributed the nations among his heavenly court. Some of the Bible translations have sons of Israel instead of his heavenly court. The contextual problem with this is that Israel didn't exist at the time of the Tower of Babel. God called Abraham and began the nation of Israel after Babel in Genesis chapter 12. Sons of Israel just can't be right. His heavenly court, or the sons of God, as it is translated in the ESV, is also what the Dead Sea Scrolls say, which is the oldest manuscript of the Bible. The ESV and NLT have that translation correct. We also see in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 19 and 20 is the opposite side of the coin as it refers to the nation of Israel. And this is how it reads. And when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. The Lord, your God, gave them to all the peoples of the earth. Remember that the Lord rescued you from the iron-smelting furnaces of Egypt in order to make you His very own people, His special possession, which is what you are today. That passage has God allotting these other gods to the nations that were dispersed at Babel. These two passages associated with the rebellion at Babel are the Old Testament's explanation of why the other nations worshipped other gods. It was divine punishment from the God of Israel. So the Tower of Babel event is similar to Romans chapter 1, where Paul tells us that God gave humankind over to their own rebellion. Because the nations would not obey God, God basically gave humanity over to the lesser gods. God gave them what they wanted, which is other gods to follow. The result is self-destruction and idolatry. This event, alongside the call of Abraham and the origin of Israel that followed, Genesis chapter 12, frames the rest of the Old Testament. It explains the spiritual conflict of Israel's God against the other gods of the nations in hostile opposition to Israel. Sadly, the gods of the other nations seduce God's own portion, Israel. And this can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and chapter 29. The conflict extends into the New Testament as well. Paul rarely uses the word demons to describe the spiritual oppositions we face. He uses words like principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and authorities, which all convey the idea of a geographical rulership. The message is that the whole world is under the dominion of unseen powers of darkness, except for those who are in Christ. The Bible sets a stage for why this is so. 
It frames the nation of Israel and all its competing enemies. Next, let's move on to insight number 26. Neither God nor Israel looked at the Old Testament laws as equal in character and importance. James chapter 2 verse 10 does tell us, For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. On one level, the meaning is clear. Break one of God's laws and you become a lawbreaker. The meaning of is as guilty is less clear, since we are accountable to God's laws whether we break them or not. The idea actually being communicated is that guilt before God is the result of breaking any law, from the most innocuous to the most heinous. Guilt is guilt. Does this mean that God considers every violation to the same level of wickedness? Every sinner is guilty, but are all sins equally awful? The answer is no. The Bible is quite clear on this matter. First, just as in our own legal judicial system, Old Testament laws could be divided into categories. One example would be case law, that is, law that depends on certain conditions. The Old Testament laws are expressed by if-then statements. If X happens, then Y is the punishment. These laws are hypothetical. The nature of the crime, and therefore its punishment, can change with a situation. Other laws are strict prohibitions regardless of the situation. These laws are not hypothetical. They are usually expressed with the familiar thou shalt not phrase. Second, the Old Testament laws did not carry the same punishment. While any violation made one guilty before God, the fact that God did not demand the same equal punishment for any violation demonstrates that all violations were not viewed in the same way. The notion that God is just as angry with a person who steals an ox as he is with a blasphemer might make for good preaching, but one is punished by paying it back in Exodus chapter 22 verse 1, and the other by death, Leviticus chapter 24 verse 16. The outcome was far from the same, and in the Old Testament the death penalty could not be atoned for by a sacrifice. And third, of the many laws in the Torah, God himself singled out one that is fundamentally important to him, and therefore to his conventional promise with his children Israel. Loving God, being loyal to him above all gods, was fundamental to possess the promised land. Loving loyalty to God was the greatest commandment, which was repeated in the New Testament several places. The lesson is not that we can take solace in not being as bad as the next person. We are all guilty before God and undeserving of eternal life as we are told in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, which says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We all need the same grace. Instead, the lesson that God is not unbalanced and cruel, viewing all acts of sin and evil in the same way, His laws are not capricious. That will conclude this week's lesson on another two insights from Dr. Heiser's book, Mastering the Bible. Next Worldview Wednesday, we will continue with two additional insights. I believe that you'll find each of these Worldview Wednesdays an interesting topic to consider as we build our biblical worldview. Tomorrow, we will continue with our three-minute humor nugget that will provide you with a bit of cheer, which will help you to line up and live a rich and satisfying life. So encourage your friends and family to join us. And they come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. If you'd like to listen to and in the past 1,290 treks or read the wisdom journals, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Wisdom Trek on your favorite podcast player so that each day's trek will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly... I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life, together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and then leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and then create a great day every day. See you tomorrow.